Thank you, Professor Tan. Actually, um, uh, Dr. Tan, I was supposed to introduce you, but I guess uh, uh, Professor Tan needs no introduction. Uh, he is our um, professor at, of economics uh, at the SMU School of Economics. I think you all have many, many burning questions. So can I invite questions from the floor? You have a mic uh, at each table so that others can hear your question. Maybe you want to either on it if it's not on. Please. I'd like to ask the speaker um, a very interesting talk. Uh, the question is, you mentioned a few concrete things that uh, people in this region can do to make sure they don't repeat, uh, perhaps in a different flavor, what's just happened to the Western countries. You mentioned institutes to study uh, the change in regulations that are being proposed by the West what sort of people would there need to be to compose these institutes so that they would be effective rather than produce potentially sterile or detached research? Yeah, um, a good question. I mean, let me ask you a question. Um, where, where, where is our equivalent of Brookings in Asia? Where is the equivalent of the Peterson Institute? Where is the equivalent of the uh, American Enterprise Institute? Answer is not there. We, you know, I mean, we have accountants, but uh, they're all in the big five firms. And the big five firms are, you know, because they're part of the arm of London or New York, they're not likely to think very independently from what London and New York is thinking. You know, I'm, not, I'm not saying that there's a good thing or bad thing, but we just need, you know, uh, we need to have a debate, right? I think it's very clear one of the problems in this crisis was there was too much monoculture. Uh, when everybody thinks the same way, uh, the markets become, you know, move only one way. Uh, you know, markets are in equilibrium. This is uh, Avinash Persaud's uh, very good point. Markets are in equilibrium when 50% of the people are optimistic and 50% are pessimistic. But at the present moment, because we're all listening to the same two news channels, Bloomberg and Reuters, effectively, when somebody comes up and says, you know, buy gold, and all of us plunging in, and when somebody will says sell, we all, we're all, you know, the market is going one way. And, that, you know, that can't be right. So what we really need in Asia, I think, you know, is to have diversity of opinions and diversity of views. And, you know, but we can only be able to do this if we spend money on research. And I, you know, I'm not just talking about you know, R&D on the IT side or the biotechnology side. On this area, it's a matter of life and death. I mean, you, know, the, if you, you can do whatever you want on biotech. Uh, yes, you increase your GDP by 1%. You know, if you do something wrong in this area, you can lose 10% of your GDP overnight. So you know, finance is a weapon of mass destruction you know, in the wrong hands. Uh, and we should, you know, better think very carefully about it. I mean, just think, the best minds in the world, top Nobel laureates, didn't see this coming. What chance have we got? If we don't start investing, you know, in our people to, to you know, because we are steering a larger and larger ship. Just to follow up to that, I mean, you alluded to this earlier, but a lot of the people from this region who are familiar enough with how the global financial system is evolving, a lot of them, maybe the vast majority, actually work for the Asian arms of Wall Street or their attendant service firms and so on and so forth. How is one able to actually get some of these people to devote part of their time to further this agenda. It seems to me that's crucial. Because they comprise a lot of very smart people 
when some of the smarter ones realize the game is, is up. And that is why they want higher bonuses, because the game is going to be up. And if they don't get it, they won't get it, right? And that's the, the real problem today, that if you really think about the real innovations that's going on in Asia, it's not happening from the large you know, complex financial institutions. The best innovations on finance is coming through India, right? Our State Bank of India, you know, I think his name is Bart, right, BP Bart. You know, he's actually transformed the state-owned banking institute to become a very market-friendly, you know, starting lending to the small, you know, the small guys, right? And it wasn't, it's an area that nobody was interested. Uh, I think it's uh, in Kenya, was it Kenya? No, sorry, it's in Bangladesh. I only heard this two days ago, that uh, because they maybe Bangladesh regulators are not so sophisticated and protective of their banking systems, the mobile phone has become mobile banking. No, the Kenya has got this, but Bangladesh is now experimenting. You know, uh, in Kenya, I, I know about the Kenya one, uh, and there are many other areas where actually you can have proper innovation by thinking out of the box. And I think Asia need to now think out of the box, right? Uh, and if we don't think out of the box, uh, are we surprised we get trapped? Yes, over here. Pick. Yeah, that's fine. First okay, I maybe I ask a question. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much, Tan Sri, for the talk. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by, by profession, so now I know why all those financial engineers are so well paid <laughs> compared to mechanical engineers. My question is, you didn't mention about Europe. You only mentioned Wall Street. I believe uh, the problem in Europe is much bigger than Wall Street in the US because the uh, EU has got common <coughs> policy, common currency, but no common decisions. And they're kind of sweeping the sovereign debt problem uh, under carpet. What, what's your take on, on Europe? Well, the, the European problem is a very different problem from the American problem, right? The, the, it depends on whether you, you know, you're a pro-European or, a, you know, sort of, you're very much like Wall Street guys. The Europeans will never, you know, will never make it sort of idea. Uh, I'm actually much more bullish on, I mean, Europe. I mean, there are people who think that Europeans can't get there political act together, but I think they will uh, because they are already too committed to this. The real issue in Europe is they have one big brother, and that's Germany, who is super efficient because of the uh, merger of uh, the two Germanys. They've gone through nearly a decade of pain, and they've come out much, much stronger than the rest of Europe. And so there has bound to be a political debate how much the winners will have to subsidize the losers for a smooth transition. But at least they have a winner. You know, you would be really in deep trouble if they, you didn't have one. Uh, the, so I, I think uh, Europe's problems are manageable, although there would be pockets of pain uh, that would, would, would have problems. I'm actually, you know, uh, amongst even in, between the U.S. and Europe, I personally think that the, the Americans will probably be fast, might get out of this faster, because the corporate sector in America is very strong. But what is unknown at this stage is that the political mood is so dark, right, that actually they're blaming the wrong guys, uh, and uh, 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 it may very well lead to the the protectionism uh, into the areas which exactly what we're all afraid of. And so we need, during this period, a very you know, cool heads and strong leadership for us to think the, all these things through. Now, I'm telling you, I'm sharing all this with you because I don't buy what I've been sold for the last 30 years. I think this crisis is very deep. And until I myself understand what this is all about. I can't give you any solutions. 
So I think I've you know, more or less got the, the details down. And now it is time for us to start thinking through you know, what Asians should be doing. Now that's a whole new ball game. Uh, uh, and, and we can't do it on our own. We need to work with Europeans, Americans, everybody. And so we need to get the research institutes, the think tanks, to start building these bridges, not just with London and New York, or, or Europe, or whatever, but within Asia. Nancy, thank you, as usual, for a very exhaustive uh, uh, discourse. You know, um, my question really relates to, uh, if you think about us in Asia, it's quite clear that over the next uh, this 10, 20 years, we talk about the Asian century, there is a substantial amount of uh, capital allocation that will be required in Asia in the coming couple of decades, whether it's the $8 trillion of infrastructure spend that ADB says, or whether it's, you know, getting the bottom of the pyramid to get up to, you know, levels that it needs to, etc. I'm kind of uh, unclear how the couple of policy prescriptions that you cite, I let the state take over the banking system in Asia to make it more secure, of course, it will be okay for DBS, but my two local competitors in Singapore might have some things to say about that. And let's levy Tobin tax and, you know, transaction tax on the system so we, we drive some taxes out of the system other than creating think tanks. It's not clear to me how these, these policy prescriptions are really going to help us in more efficient capital allocation and help us in being able to improve our GDPs and the conditions of our people over the next 10, 20 years. So maybe I'm missing the point somewhere. Well, in, in a sense, the, the capital allocation in Asia is not that difficult. Right? It, it really is not that difficult. The, the real difficulty is the mindset. Look at Japan. Japan invests far, far more in the two advanced markets than in the rest of Asia. And the same goes for China. Right? Uh, the surplus economies in Asia actually don't invest that much within Asia. And yet, actually, it's internally within Asia that needs a lot of this financing. Okay? Simple example is your southern neighbor, I mean Indonesia, which needs huge amount of infrastructure and is a large population and it's huge potential. It has certain problems, but you know, if we solve the the actual governance issues on how to get the infrastructure on the ground, uh, you will see rapid growth. And I so therefore the the delivery mechanism in Asia is more a political question rather than a technical one. Okay, so my question is really, I don't believe a state-controlled financial system will ever achieve that capital allocation that we need in Asia. But Asia has done this for the last 50 years. I don't think Asia's capital allocation today is anything no, we're not, I'm, no, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that it is something to be very proud of, but we've done it for 50 years. And it's still being uh, um, state owned. And, you know, you are not likely to see very, very major changes. Okay? You're not likely to see very, very major changes. The state will still maintain control, you know, in the key areas. That's no doubt in my mind, Asian, you know, Asian, the, uh, Financial systems will not be let go, in which, as you know, Augustine's fundamental point, in which the, the, the bank I've let go is now bigger than the state. And then when the time comes, the state has to write the check for, 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 for the bankers. I mean, it doesn't make sense, right? So they will control it. The real issue is how do you control it and where do you let go? Now that's, you know, it's in the same sense the difference between, you know, you and I as tennis players, right? No, none of us can, you know, beat Federer because he plays in his own unique style. 
And, and so governance is all about developing the system, the way in which the government successfully mimics the market. I mean, Singapore itself is a very good example how the state has actually played a very, 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 very positive role. Now, you know, you, know, you, 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 you could get more you know, market guidance. And in fact, the reason why Asian state intervention is better than the Soviet one and the ones in Africa and Latin America is because the Asian states mimics the market. But the real trouble now is the market is now highly distorted. That's the point I was trying to make. So when the market is even more distorted, the state is even in a more confused situation, which, are, which way do you move? Right? So now the advantage of Asia, in my view, you know, I, you know I, 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 that, that's why I think, right? The doctor goes of this world, look at the situations, and I need to make a judgment. It may not be very popular with some of you guys, but I just do it. And it's proven to be right. Of course, you know, these leaders could be blamed a lot if they proved to be wrong. But by and large, you know, crossing the river by feeding the stones in Asia is not random. The Asians have not been able to articulate why they are successful. That's why we have no Nobel Prize winners. Maybe we don't need Nobel Prize winners. Right? We've worshipped these guys and they've sold out of a load of, load of goods. So, you know, in my view, I think, what if, if you know, because, you know, if you just say, allow the market, you think the market will actually, you know, send the, the, the money to Indonesia? I don't think so. Not without Asian regulators, Asian policymakers sitting down on one table and say, we will create the infrastructure to do this. Because for physical infrastructure to succeed, you need institutional infrastructure. That was my point, right? We haven't built the institutional infrastructure. Europe succeeded because it has the institutional infrastructure. All central bankers and policymakers, Ministry of Finance people, go weekly, monthly to Basel, quarrel with each other for 50 years before they got into the world. Where do we do this? We, 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 we in Asia meet each other very, very politely, have a nice lunch, you know, provide the local uh, music and uh, art and architecture. And then we go home, and we're all very nice and friendly until the crisis blows, and then we say, call in the IMF.